Hey, I'm Zach. Thanks so much for checking out this week's message. I hope that it encourages you. I hope it challenges you. And I hope that it causes you to dive deeper into God's Word. I also hope that you have some community around you that you can talk through some of these things with. And if you don't, we'd love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore, whether that's coming to one of our Sunday gatherings or coming to one of our Restore groups. Either way, we would love to see you. You can get more information about that on our website at RestoreAustin.org. And I hope you enjoyed this week's video. tells you so much about who we are as a church and what we're about and what's important to us. Um, and like I said a little while ago, this morning we are in the last week of our Family Values series, and it's just been a series looking at what we as a church family here at Restore value. And we're calling it Family Values because we believe that the church is not um, a building, the church is not chairs, the church is not a band or a preacher, the church is people. And it's a group of people that come together and rally around each other and walk through life together. It's a group of people defined by some of the stuff that were always on that screen just now. We spent the first four weeks looking at these core values of who we are as a church, grace, authenticity, diversity, and partnerships. And we spent a week going over each one of those things. If you, didn't, if you missed any of those or would like to know more about what those specific values are, those are available online. I'd love for you to go back and watch those. But today, we're kind of talking about how all of those things culminate together and propel us forward as a church. We're talking about really the mission that God is on in us and through us. We're asking the question, what's next? And here to help us answer that question is our good friend, Christian Brimstone. So, one last Christian Brimstone video. Take a look. He's being shy today. special treat. Today we're going to talk about family values. I'm going to teach you the principles for Christian living in the church. Music and title screen. Oh, I'm not supposed to say that. Whoops. Okay. important question. What's next? What do I do with all this information? That's a very good question for you to ask. What do you do with all these values? Well, that's completely up to me. But most importantly, what's that? But most importantly, you need to remember that if you are not a licensed minister, well, you can only do so much. <clears throat> There's a reason we have pastors, points to self, and regular people. Now, it's not your job to wave the flag of these values. Now, that's the pastor's job. That's my job. It's your job to make sure your pastors keep doing these things for you. That's your role, okay? Okay, <laughs> to close, I like to remember this acronym. I know, I know, I'm throwing another acronym at you. Guilty as charge. 
<laughs> the acronym is not a sin, though. <laughs> I know, I'm a pastor. Now, I'm going to fill this acronym out. You can send it all family values. And this is my last one. It stands for family values. F-A-M-I-L-L-Y-L-Y space V-A-L-U-E-S, family values. Four average members in lay ministry values are like unique suggestions. <laughs> unique suggestions for better Christian living. <laughs> it has been fun. Thank you so very, very much for joining me. Many blessings to you. Are you going to get them? You Christian soldier, you. <laughs> Remember, if you need an ark, well, I know a guy. <laughs> if you need an ark, I know a guy. You didn't get that the first time. <laughs> I want to take a second and give it up for the incredibly talented Joey Banks. Uh, actor, bass player, all around great guy. We had such a fun time filming these. There were so many times where we literally had to stop and do another take because I was in the like other side of the room laughing too loud and it would get on the film. Um, we, we filmed these for a specific purpose though. We filmed them to kind of like put a satirical, humorous bend on some people's views of church or some people's, I would say, incorrect uh, assumptions about church and who we are and what we're supposed to be like. And I think it's so interesting that Christian Brimstone says in this last video, if you are not a licensed minister, you can only do so much. And I, I think when you put it, like I said, into the satirical, you know, 90s style training video, it, it's funny and it's, it's kind of dumb, but I think that so, so many of us have thought, right? I'm not, I'm not up on stage. I'm not a pastor. I've never been through seminary or any training or anything like that. I, I really can only do so much. You know, I really need to just kind of trust that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Maybe I'll come on Sundays. Maybe I'll, you know, serve in a little way. But I, I can't really do the big things. I can't really like, tell people about Jesus or be a, a big example of grace or those kinds of things. And this idea is as old as religion itself. You see, the Jewish people were a part of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, a system where they had to go through a priest to connect to God. So if you aren't familiar with it, at least once a year, but a lot of times, many times more than that, they had to actually take an animal, go to a priest, have the priest sacrifice it to atone for their sins. They couldn't really directly commune or communicate with God. They had to go through this intermediate. Not only did they have to go through a priest for forgiveness, their mission was massive. It was over 600 laws, 600 do's and don'ts of things that they constantly had to be thinking about and remembering and enacting. And every time they failed, which was often, they had to go back to that same priest to bring that sacrifice and say, would you just talk to God about this? I, I know that he's, I guess he's upset with me. I don't know. I, I just, could you talk to him about this for me? And it was like they had a broad mission narrow access to God. A really broad mission, over 600 things they had to do, and really narrow access to God. They had to go through a priest to talk to him. But Jesus changed all that. He saw how broken the world was, how burdened and overwhelmed the people that he loved were. And his great love for us drove him to leave the perfection of heaven, come to the brokenness of earth. To live that perfect life that none of us could ever live. And that same love drove him to the cross to die the death that we deserve. And then was raised to life again to give us access to life. It was his great love that drove him to that. And it changed everything before we had a broad mission. 600 plus laws and narrow access to God through priests. But now we have broad access to God and a narrow mission. Let me explain what I mean by that. 
Now, we have direct and constant access to God through the Holy Spirit. We don't have to go through priests anymore. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us about this. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful life. No need to go through an intermediary. No need to go through a priest anymore. We are priests now. We have direct access to God at any point, at any time, every moment. Hebrews later, that same chapter says that we can be before his throne of grace whenever we want. We don't have to travel anywhere. We don't have to bring sacrifices anywhere. We don't have to ask anybody's permission. Right now, you can close your eyes and you can be in the throne room of God. Communing personally with him because of the Holy Spirit that indwells you. It's an amazing thing. But Jesus not only broadened our access, broadened the priesthood, he narrowed the mission. And you remember the mission before was to follow tons and tons of laws, but now it's simple. It's narrow. Jesus gives it to his disciples in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, a passage widely known as the Great Commission. Verse 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. Now, it's really important for us to note that when this mission was narrowed, it wasn't exactly at the most opportune time for the disciples. They weren't really going through a happy moment in their lives. In fact, they were essentially in hiding. Jesus, just days before, had died on the cross. They watched their best friend, their leader, die, and now they're all desperately scared for their own lives. They're hiding when they get this news. But after the tomb, where Jesus was buried, is found empty by Mary Magdalene, she rushes to the disciples to tell them not only is Jesus alive, but he wants to talk with you. He has a message for you. And that very same day, he appears to them and gives them that simple mission. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and tell the world my story. The thing that I've been doing with you for the last three years, walking through life, teaching you, talking with you, being there through the ups and the downs, through the hard times and the good. Go and do that with everybody that you encounter. Can you imagine being in the disciples' shoes here? Just moments before they still thought their best friend and leader was dead. Now he's standing before them and telling them to go out and tell the world about who he is. The same world that just killed him. He's saying, don't be afraid. Go out and do what I've done with you. I'm sure they were standing in front of Jesus with wide eyes, right? And, and racing hearts. I bet they felt so incredibly overwhelmed. And that's why I love the last line of the Great Commission so much. At the end of verse 20, Jesus says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That term, surely, is a term used to remind someone of something, to bring back a memory of something that has already happened. Jesus basically saying, remember what I told you. I am with you. Always. And that sentence would have, would have triggered the disciples' memories. They would have remembered the words of Jesus just a few nights before. As they sat around a table during that last supper, they would have remembered him. You see, on the night before Jesus laid down his life on the cross, he gathered up his disciples for one last meal together. During their time that night, it started off rather innocently, just celebrating the Passover like they'd done every year together, it quickly turned into something very different. Jesus predicts his betrayal by Judas. He predicts that Peter was going to deny ever knowing him, and then he goes on to predict his own death. Not exactly dinner party conversation. And even though it wasn't the first time that Jesus had talked about his death, I really think that for the disciples sitting around the table that night, it was the first time it really started to sink in. They really started to understand a little bit about what was going to happen next. They start to worry. They start to get scared for their own lives, as well as the life of their best friend who is saying he's about to die. 
their worry and their fear understandable, though, right? I, mean, I can't imagine being in their shoes. They just arrived in Jerusalem a few days before with this red carpet treatment. Remember that they, they walk into the city on Palm Sunday and people are laying down coats and branches and shouting, Hosanna, God be with us. All the disciples are, are walking behind Jesus and they're like rock stars. I, it really was amazing. It was the height of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And yet a few days later, as the disciples are preparing for what's next, they're thinking, oh man, Jesus is about to do everything we've always wanted him to do. He's about to take, take back everything that was stolen from us by the Romans. He's about to kick them out. He's about to lead an army into war. Remove them from power and then point us to rule next to him. All of their dreams they thought were coming true. But that's not what was going to happen. They were beginning to see that night that Jesus had a very different plan. And they're scared. They're scared not only because the plan that they thought was going to be enacted is not, but they're scared because now their best friend's going to die. And they don't know what's going to happen to them either. And it's in that moment, at the height of their fear and anxiety, that Jesus makes an incredible promise. John 14, starting in verse 15. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In that moment, at the height of their fear, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, our advocate when we are weak, our peace in the midst of chaos, our healer when we're hurt, our comforter when we're broken. The world can't see the Holy Spirit, but Jesus tells the disciples that they will know him because he resides inside of them. Then, Jesus goes on not only to predict his own death and resurrection, he actually predicts the very moment we just read about when he gives the disciples the Great Commission. The next verse, verse 19. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. He's saying, I'm going to die in just a few hours I'm going away forever but you will see me I'm going to reappear to you and because I live you will also live and then on that day you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you on that day well that day came for the disciples when Jesus rose and appeared to them just days later and gave them their mission and on that day Jesus reminds them he had said just a few nights before, I am with you always. That through his Holy Spirit inside of them, he never leaves them. But why does that matter for us? Right? Well, here's the thing. That mission isn't just for the disciples. That mission has been given by Jesus to every single member of God's family who has ever lived. Including our family here at Restore. We have been called by Jesus to make disciples, to go and tell his story to everyone we can, to enter into relationships with people just like he did, to walk through life with them, to care for them, to be there when they need us, to never let them go, no matter who they are or what they've done. Wow, that can feel impossible sometimes, right? I can feel so overwhelming. And just like the disciples, I think that we hear that and we immediately start feeling inadequate. We start feeling like, I can't do that, though. You hear me say that and you say, in fact, you don't know what I have going on, though. I mean, you don't know how busy I am. You don't know how much pressure's on me. You don't know what, what my family's going through. You don't know what I'm going through. I can't do that. That's why, just like the disciples, everything starts with trusting the words of Jesus when he says, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. 
Listen to the way Jesus explains it. That same night, just a few verses later in John 15, 4. He tells his disciples, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in them will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. The reason we feel so overwhelmed and inadequate all the time is because we are. It's because we can't do it by ourselves. It's because in and of our own strength and power, we fall short every single time. We run out. We get tired. We give in to the the brokenness of our world. But when we are connected to the vine, when we are abiding in Christ, we will never fail. We will never grow weary. Abiding in Christ isn't an action. It's a recognition. Stay with me on this. It all starts with this deep understanding of your position in Christ. Who he says you are. And matures into a trust that all good things flow out of that position. It starts with understanding who you are in Christ. And then it matures into understanding that any good things, any fruit, any positive steps toward the mission he's called us to flows out of Christ in us. I love this word, abide. And you may or may not know it, but the New Testament was originally written in uh, Greek. And it was the language that was common in the first century when Jesus was on earth. It was written and spoken during that time and place. And this word in the Greek language, abide, it's used in, in a variety of ways. Here in scripture and all over kind of first century Greek writing. But my favorite is this term of hospitality. And it was used when like a weary traveler was was passing through a city on a journey, barely able to put one foot in front of the other after walking such a long way. And a homeowner in that town would walk out with a simple invitation. Would you like to abide with me tonight? Would you like to come into my home literally translates to stay in the house. Abide, would you like to stay in the house with me? It was an invitation to rest, to food, to water, to friendship, to strength. It was an invitation to stop trying to just push through, to stop trying to make it to the next town, to stop just putting one foot in front of the other because my friend, I see you, you're about to collapse, so just come and abide for a little while. Just put your feet up, take a rest, have a meal. And even if it's just for a night, abide in a place where your needs can be met. And abiding in a place is great. You probably even have a place like that. Maybe for you it's, it's a garden. And you like to, to get out there and get your hands in the dirt and, and start planting things and, watering things and seeing things grow. And that's a place where when you go, you just abide there. And it gives you strength. Maybe it's your patio. You go out and overlook a backyard or a front yard and you just get to sit for a little while in the peace and the calm and look at the nature that God's created. Maybe it's your favorite coffee shop with your favorite drink. You just get to sit there and no matter how many conversations are happening around you, you just get to kind of sit and look out and, and abide find a rest there. Maybe it's just your couch, you know, with your significant other. Just watching a television show or talking. Maybe it's out hiking, hunting, walking around and being in God's creation. Maybe it's playing sports. Maybe it's dinner with friends. Maybe it's anything. I don't know what your place of abiding is, but you go and you abide in that place for a while because it, it meets your needs gives you strength for what's ahead. But the problem with these places is that we can't be in them all the time. We have responsibilities. We have things that we have to do. We have pressure. We have busy lives. We have to keep coming back to them when we quickly get weary and overburdened. But the beautiful thing about Jesus being in us And us being in him is that we don't have to abide in a place. 
We get to abide in a person. And I'm going to tell you, it's so much better. Because even on my best days, on my patio or in my coffee shop or with my favorite drink or with my amazing family, even on those best days, I can't be there all the time. I can't live in those places. But Jesus abides in us all the time. Places are great, but they're stationary. You can't take them with you. Jesus, by his spirit, indwells us, and we get to choose moment by moment whether we abide in him. He abides in us all the time. He is our provision, our place of rest, our strength when we're weary, our food and water when we're hungry and thirsty, our comfort when we're in need, our healer when we're broken. He is all of those things to us all of the time. And now, for us, we get to choose whether we abide in him. Whether we try to do things on our own strength or his. When you put it like that, choosing not to abide in Jesus seems dumb, right? Why did we ever do that? He has everything that we could ever need. He offers everything that we can have. Choosing not to abide in Christ makes just about as much sense as ignoring the invitation of a hospitable homeowner as we walk through town weary and tired. Because we're too proud or too self-reliant to admit that we need some help. I do this all the time. I do it all the time. And I know that I get to stand up here and you sit out there, but there's not this much distance between us when it comes to this kind of stuff. I mean, I tell you, it's like every day that I forget to abide in Christ, that I forget to really trust him for what he's asking me to do. Sometimes it's, it's big stuff, you know, sometimes it's, it's weekly stuff like prepping a message or sometimes it's just getting out of bed in the morning and I'm like, God, I can't do this. And he's like, I know, I know you can't, sweet boy. It's okay, but I can. So trust me. It's not that I have no faith. It's not that I and bitter and resentful, or, or that I, I don't like God, it's that I forget, you know? I think as people, we're not bad. Most of the time, we're just forgetful. We forget that, man, that same love that drove Jesus from heaven to earth, from perfect, a perfect life to a horrific death on the cross, that same love not only lives inside of us, but empowers us to live life to the full. In John 10, Jesus said, I have come so that you may have life and have it to the full, have it abundantly. And he's not asking a bunch of stuff in order for us to get that full life. He's just saying, trust me, abide in me, rest in me, find strength in me. And as we move forward with the mission that God has given us as a church family here at Restore, I'll just be honest with you. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know where we're going. I don't know what our church will look like in one year or five years or 10 years. I don't know who will be out there. I don't know who will be up here. I hope it's still me. (laughs) (laughs) But I know that Jesus' call for us remains the same. Abide in me. Trust in me. There's this old cliche that I've heard all the time, but it's so true, and it just says, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. I feel like that all the time. Like, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where we're going. I don't know where our church is going, but I know that he knows, and I know that instead of asking me to figure it all out and make it all happen, he's just saying, Zach, trust me. Abide in me. Find your strength. So as a church family, this morning, I want to give us the opportunity to make a commitment here and now, both personally and as a whole church family, to trust and abide in Christ, no matter what tomorrow holds. And we're going to do it in the exact way that the disciples did it that night, through communion. 
around a table. See, when the disciples sat around the table that night, they had no idea what was coming. They, they heard Jesus predict his death. They heard Jesus predict some betrayals and some just really, really tough things to hear. But I know in their mind, they were just thinking, what happens next? Where do we go from here? What's going to happen not only to my best friend, but what's going to happen to me? They were anxious. They were scared. They were nervous. They had no idea what was coming. And I'll tell you, I don't know what's coming either. But Jesus told them the same thing that he tells us. Abide in me. We don't have all the answers. But like the disciples, we can come around the table and offer the one thing that we have to Jesus. And that's our trust. God, I trust you. No matter where you take us, no matter what the journey looks like, I know that you are good and that you love me so deeply and desperately that you are worth placing my faith and trust in. Now, in just a second, we're going to have some people come down and they're going to take these trays and they're going to pass them back. The grapes representing the wine that night, the crackers representing the bread. And as you take it, I just want you to, to hold on to it, okay? Because we're going to come back and we're going to take it all together in just a second. So as they come by, you grab a grape, grab a cracker, and hold on to them. But I also want to say that if you're not really sure about this whole communion thing, or if you're not even really sure about this whole Jesus thing, don't feel any pressure to take a cracker or a grape. Just, just pass the tray by you. I promise that no one's going to look down on you. No one's going to judge you. But in that same vein, if you've heard this story about a, a weary traveler and you identify with that, you think, if I take one more step, I'm just going to fall over. I'm going to tell you that there is a, a hospitable homeowner coming out to your aid and saying, abide in me. And it's not just for a night. It's for the rest of your life. And so if that's something that you're compelled by, if that's something that you're interested in, don't let this moment pass you by. You can take a cracker, take a grape, or just come and talk to me. I would love to talk with you about what it looks like to place your faith and your trust in Jesus and truly live life abiding in him, trusting in him, finding your strength in him. But like I said, if you'd like to tell Jesus and our church family that you are ready to abide in Christ, that you don't know what's coming for you and you don't know what's coming for us as a church, you don't know what the mission that God has called us on necessarily looks like 1, 5, 10, 20 years from now, but you know that you want to trust in him for it, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to pray and they're going to come by. Just grab the elements and hold on to them. Let's pray. <coughs> God, thank you for the truth from your word this morning. Thank you that just like we started with the very beginning of our gathering together, that God, this isn't something new. This is something that your family, your children have been doing for generation after generation. That our brothers and sisters have been walking through these same issues, asking these same questions and weary from the same burdens for thousands of years. But tonight, or that night, the disciples were around that table. They didn't know what was coming next. And just like us this morning, you gave them those simple word of encouragement, God. Abide in me. So I pray that in this moment, as these communion elements come by, God, that we would hold on to them, that we would remember what you said. Remember this great mission of restoration that you're on, and we would trust and abide in you no matter what comes, because you are good. It's in Jesus' name.